All right, our next talk is from Will Bridewell, and he'll be talking about taking the intentional stance seriously. Okay. Well, I'm starting early. Uh, thanks for being here. I changed my title from what's in the program because an anonymous reviewer thought it was a little ambitious, and I wanted it to, to wanted Pat to like the title more. Um, so, uh, I'm going to start out with a test of intuitions. I don't expect you to raise your hands. I don't want to see your hands. Um, thanks, Pat. And but just in general, we're starting. So I assume people are familiar with AlphaGo and the that series of programs, and that they play Go, and that they're the best Go players in the world, and they're they're just they're just wonderful bits of technology. Um, and so one one question I'd like you to think about is: Does AlphaGo select moves? So if you've read the papers, and then you probably have an idea of whether this is uh, the answer to this might be yes or no for yourself, and also objectively. Um, but a follow-up question might be, does AlphaGo play Go? And, you know, again, this is a personal uh, opinion that you might have. I don't care what your personal opinion is publicly, but you can, you can tell me about it later, and I'd be glad to listen. Um, and I want to drill down a little bit. Even if you think that AlphaGo plays Go, which you might, uh, do you think that AlphaGo wants to win? Yeah, you, you, I hear some laughter. Some some people believe this, um, but and and I'm not going to say that you know it's fine to believe that because if if you want to say ask the question does AlphaGo want to win there's a view in which AlphaGo does want to win and it, we'll talk, call this kind of the thin view. Uh, AlphaGo is a, is a program that evaluates moves, it maximizes its reward, it improves with experience. These are all things we would expect people to do if they wanted to win, and it certainly seems to to meet these these criteria. And that's, that's fine. Um, there are other things, though, that we think about wanting to win when we talk about people, like, like they get excited when they win, or they, they get really determined when they're playing, and it's hard to kind of distract them. They'll prioritize playing Go over things like phone calls or food or, or whatever might happen. And because of these priorities, they're, they're responsible for want, their desire to win. And this is going to be, you know, this, this can cause problems, you know, if you get an emergency phone call and you ignore it because you're, you're super en enthralled with it. And of course, if you, if you lose, you might, might get angry. Um, and there, there's plenty of these sorts of things that, that we could add and consider. And the question is, for, for any particular cognitive system, which of these properties matter and, and why, why might they matter? And when we think about um, systems in this way, we're taking in what Daniel Dennett calls the intentional stance, and in that we view others or objects as having mental states that guide their behavior. And the thin view of the intentional stance, and it should be familiar to people, which is that you have a set of desires, you have some beliefs about how to achieve those desires or how to satisfy those desires. Through some practical reasoning, you form intentions to do certain things, then and those intentions cause you to behave in particular ways. And what is so for mental states for the, for cognitive systems, this this thin view might be might be sufficient. But what are some of the alternatives if we want to uh, think about how to enrich in these these concepts? So we're going to take a closer look at the at intention inside of this view, and it's we're going to look at it through the lens of planning, through action, and through control. Um, and starting off with intention and planning, which is kind of this first bit about practical reasoning, and a lot of people here will be familiar with what planning, you know, it's this is really like AI planning, have that in mind. So when we think about intentions from this perspective, we think about them as directed toward the future. Um, they, uh, you know, we determine what to do through our plans. When we set an intention, we've chosen a particular plan that we later execute. And so if I say something like I intend to make pizza tomorrow, what I'm doing is I'm signifying a plan was made and that I've adopted that plan. I'm not really telling you how detailed that plan is. You don't have to know anything about how I'm going to do it. Um, um, and it doesn't say that I'm going to succeed at it because I, who knows? So whenever you're thinking in terms of cognitive systems and in terms of how to do they, you know, what intentions are inside those cognitive systems, you just need to ask something like, can the cognitive system make and store plans? 
So another view of this or an extension of this is um, uh, planning has, is a commitment to, to deliberation you've made. And you can see these as, as public commitments that you've made. So if you say, I intend to make pizza tomorrow, that, that reduces uncertainty about your behavior for the people that you've said that to. And you kind of, you're accountable for what you do. So you're responsible to kind of have made pizza. People expect you to have done that. And this facilitates collaboration, such as if you wanna drop by around dinner time with a bottle of wine and we can have a dinner party. So this is another kind of sense in which intentions are, uh, or a property that intentions have that's kind of important to take into account. And you can ask, you know, does your cognitive system, if it makes plans, does it commit to them? Some planning systems just make plans. Uh, um, but intentions are also private commitments. So by setting an intention, I'm anchoring or stabilizing my plans so that I, I can deliberate in the future. So if I say I, I intend to go to college to become a professor of anthropology, that anchors um, you know, a further plan. So I can say, well, I, I will specialize in archeology. span And it, but it also constrains future deliberation. So things that would poten potentially interfere with me achieving, achieving my goals set for the, with, associated with that plan, I'm not gonna consider. So I'm not going to attend art school, for instance. And the result is you get consistent goal pursuit. Your agent over time is able to, to achieve its goals. So all that, I, I'm assuming that like a, that's kind of preaching to the choir. People understand what planning is and that what all the characteristics of planning are. These phenomena are important. And of course, that you could ask, does a cognitive system's current plans influence its future plans? And not always the case. This would require kind of long-term systems. Um, but uh, that's kind of, intention viewed as planning. Now, if we look at intention from a perspective of action, we, we're looking at kind of what the relationship is between intention and intentional action. And one effect that's important to keep in mind, so if you look at the left-hand diagram, in addition to belief, desire, and intention, we've added skill and awareness. And this comes from a work by Bertram Mall and Josh No. And so, if you imagine a scenario where Edgar gets a bullseye while playing darts, you somebody might look at that, and if you tell them, well, Edgar is a beginner, they're going to have a different sort of re response to whether that was an intentional action on Edgar's part. Sure, Edgar might have intended to get a bullseye, but he was lacking, he was lacking in skill, so it could have been accidental. And it would be weird to call, say, somebody who's just picked up a, uh, picked up a game uh, as, you know, uh, has it to say that they have the ability to turn all of their intentions into actual effective and correct intentional actions. So if I tell you Edgar has played several games of darts, that's gonna change your opinion a little bit. And you might say, well, okay, that maybe it was an intentional action. Or if I tell you that he's a local dart champion, then, then you're gonna have a different perspective. Um, but what's, Im what's important from a cognitive system standpoint is does it know about its capabilities? If it doesn't know about kind of what skills it has, how, how can you say that it, the actions that it, it that it produces are have the appropriate relationship to the intentions that it might have or the plans that it might make? So it needs to know what it can and what it cannot do. Um, we can talk about this in terms of awareness too, is in a, in the, on the other side of the diagram. And by this, I mean awareness of what actions you're taking. So in the scenario outlined here, say Amelia wants to give away her coat along with some other items. She has a little practical reasoning, decides to donate it. So on one hand, she might, you might find, well, Amelia puts her coat in a box and she donates it. Well, that's an intentional action on her part. She intended to, to give it away. She found, came up with a plan and she uh, achieved the action and she was aware of what she was doing. That second one's more interesting where Amelia searches for her coat and gives up. But what she doesn't know is that behind the scenes, her mother knew she was gonna donate the coat and had already put it in the box. And so Amelia goes and donates the box. She's donated her coat, but we wouldn't say that she's done that intentionally. We would say, well, she's, it's sort of an accident that she did that and, and she doesn't even, might not even know about it unless she hears later. So a cognitive system needs to have the ability to report on its actions if it's going to behave, if it's going to have intentions, it's going to behave intentionally. And these actions, it's important to note are ambiguous. So if you look at these, these pictures, um, 
generated by AI, perfectly normal pictures, nothing wrong with them. Um, you might have potential descriptions of these like, you know, this person's knocking over a cup or they're reaching for a book or grabbing for a book or being a nuisance in general. Now, if, the, told, if I told you, well, if this was me and I told you my intention was to pick up a book and I happened to knock over a cup of coffee, you wouldn't really blame me for it. You'd probably say, well, you know, accidents happen or something like that. Now, if I did that repeatedly, if I was this kind of guy who went around and said, I'm going to grab that book and just knocked over coffee every single time because really I was knocking over coffee and I couldn't care less about the book, then you might have a different opinion of me. But it's important to have a clear and accurate representation of those intentions so we can facilitate trust. So I should, you know, if I were a system, I might ask, can the, can the cognitive system properly report on its intentions? It's one thing to have intentions, but to describe them in a way that's actually accurate for how it's carrying them out and what sort of what the actions will what form the actions will take is important. So, okay, now I'm on the, the third bit here. Uh, intentions from the lens of control. This might be less even less familiar, I suspect, but um, we start out with some familiar ter territory. And the idea is intentions aren't kind of just uniform things necessarily, at least not with people. There's, they're multi-layered and there's feedback amongst those layers. So at the top level here, this is a, a diagram from Elizabeth Poshery's work. Um, you have kind of the deliberation and planning part of intentions. These are, I'm making plans and I intend to do this. And just as an example, we might plan a route to get here, like drive up Wilson Boulevard and take a left at Kirkwood or something like that. And then whenever, uh, whenever I go to execute that plan, I might notice that, well, it's a busy area or there's a lot of construction or something. And I will have to situate my, my, the execution of my intentions appropriately and so that I attend to pedestrians, cars, traffic signs, maybe more than I would normally. Um, and what by, once I situate myself, then I can set my target speed. So maybe I'm driving a little slower. I place both hands on the wheel so I have more control over the vehicle. I always drive with both hands on the wheel. Um, and the way that I do this influences kind of motor control level where I have throttle and steering actions, braking actions, and so forth. And up, up on the right-hand side of this, there's, there are these feedback arrows. So errors or problems that arise among any of these things can then feed back. So I might get to this busy area and I notice, well, I've got to drive carefully. And then I may decide to go back up and replan as a result of it being a busy area. Or I may not even worry about that until I find out, oh, I'm, I'm a, actually, it's really hard for me to kind of get there and drive care, as carefully as I'd like to. So my, you know, I might get feedback and go all the way up to replanning. So do, the, do your cognitive systems intentions integrate planning and execution because for people, they integrate planning and execution, and there's these layers of feedback that, that tell you when to replan and so forth. Um, another thing about, uh, another point about control is that you, guidance is required here, and we see intentions as playing a role of structuring at attention. So they, by uh, attention allows you to identify opportunities for action if I'm attending to the right things. Then I can then I can probably grab them more quickly or avoid di disaster more easily. I I can use my intentions to guard against distractions. So I can say, well, I intend to sit down and um, and or I, you know I, I intend to drive on this road and take an exit up here on the right. So I'm not going to play around with my with my radio. Or intentions also enable mo monitoring of ongoing action. All of this require kind of interfaces with attention to to produce action in the end. So intending to select a radio station, for instance, if you're driving, can override your ongoing monitoring and you could, for instance, maybe miss an exit or uh, something else. Now, do, your, do the intentions that you have guide your behavior in this sort of, in this sort of way um, in, in your cognitive systems? It depends. Um, Another view of intentions is for control is that you can have these, you can set an implementation intentions, which are kind of small plans that look like rules. So when I attend the reception or the poster session, I'm going to avoid the bar. I'm sure there's going to be a bar here, Jamie. Um, or when I'm close to my exit, I will focus on the road. Uh, so that way I will, won't, won't 
play with the radio and miss taking my exit. And so we have these triggering conditions that remind you of your intentions at the appropriate time. So this is some, some way in which intentions are, they, they help you control your behavior and they're related to intentional action as well. So are your intentions responsive to the environment? Does my, do my intentions kind of respond? Do they, do they come in or go out depending on what opportunities occur in the environment? So that's a few phases of attention. It's nine. I don't know. It's uh, uh, this list is in the paper with a minor edit. Um, and I just want to kind of move on to make, talk about making progress on intention. So suppose that you wanted to build your system and you said, I want to have kind of a cognitive systems approach, to, you know, a cognitive system that has intentions and the way people do and what, so that people can expect it when it commits to its intentions or it set, announces its intentions, it's going to behave in the way that people might behave. How might we do this? Um, this is kind of a research methodology part. So one is to do expectation management. And I, I would take in the paper, you can see more on this, but you can take um, uh, some influence from the work on autonomous driving, where you have a bunch of driving relevant phenomena separated into categories and then specific behavioral competencies. And it's sort of similar to how the intention and relevant phenomena are laid out, but you can imagine there are a lot more for a lot for driving. There are a lot more that could be added in terms of what makes what, what is an intention relevant phenomenon. And so you want to adapt the phenomena to specific scenarios as well. So even in the driving case, you find that whenever there's a particular scenario you want to evaluate, it gets broken down and, and specified in according to these to different criteria that are decided upon. And you want to specify which phenomena will be, be accounted for. So it's not the case that every cognitive system would need to implement every possible feature that we, when we think about people and we, in the, from an intentional stance, um, having, you know, the cognitive system would just need to, you would say which ones you're going to, to uh, implement. The approach I would take to do this is a methodological computationalism. It's just kind of uh, cribs off of, of Newell's 20 questions. Um, where you, it centers model building, which should be friendly in a cognitive systems community, where the idea is that you build these models, you implement, and, and if what you're trying to do is explore intention relevant phenomena, what, what might computational models of intention relevant phenomena look like? You, be, you would build a model and, uh, and evaluate it, and then you'd build another model um, and it, 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 that kind of covers all of the previous phenomena plus some. I mean, it's just incremental model improvement type stuff. Uh, how you declare insufficiency is, uh, is up for debate. Um, I have a paper on something like that, but I don't think it quite applies here. Uh, the important thing is that there's some stakeholder involvement though. So uh, you have researchers across disciplines that you want to get involved. If you look at the little diagram there, that you have some challenge, like what's that, that you, you know, somebody says, well, your system doesn't do this. And then you engage with research across, researchers across disciplines to see what it might look like. You implement some, uh, you identify some intention relevant phenomena and you implement your computational model. and the backward arrow, is, backward arrow is really about stakeholder involvement apart from disciplinary experts where you have deployers of the technology, users of the technology, and community members influenced by that technology contributing to what is missing from what you've, what you've developed. And it's sort of taken inspiration from the DARPA work on explanatory AI where one of the lessons learned is in this quote, uh, by hearing firsthand from the different stakeholders about what they need in terms of it, in their case, XAI, in this case, maybe uh, intentional systems. Developers will be better able to help stakeholders develop good mental models of the system. And it's really their mental models of the system that you have, you're, you're fighting with whenever somebody's trying to use your, your uh, computer or whatever, whatever you've built. Um, the kind of the motivation for this was something like Siri or Alexa, where you know, you're, caught, you're interacting with something in natural language, but it definitely does not understand natural language in the way that you might hope. 
Um, so we've done some work in this, and this is kind of sort of the final bit of slides. Uh, and we're really focusing on at, at NRL on plan execution and intentions. There, you can see at the very bottom of this, we're doing this in a or the Arcadia framework for intelligent systems. And this is more of an advertisement, I, I, I should say, I suppose. So this is kind of that's why I'm going fast. Right, is we've we've explored implementing uh, intentions in that have that meet some various criteria in an autonomous driving environment and where it moves around and it's following vehicles, it's driving speed limits, it's braking for stoplights and monitoring whether those stoplights stay red. If they, if they turn green, then it, it switches its behavior. And so it's managing its intentions over time. Uh, we've also started to do this sort of work inside of like grid world based environments. Um, so that which are a little bit easier to deal with. Uh, and that's just one part of the work that we're doing at the uh, Navy Center for uh, Applied Research and Artificial Intelligence at NRL. And if you're interested in kind of building the sorts of systems that look deeply into what what intentions might be and what how to computationalize different theories about intentions, then you know, we have we have openings. And if you're interested in anything else that's on this slide, you can talk to David Aha, who knows all about all of the material here. I only know about the stuff I said today, barely that. And uh, that's it. Mike. One of the things you didn't mention was anything about procrastination, nor did you mention anything about the cost of plans, at least directly, and they both seem to be related. Do you have a uh, thought about either? Well, I guess I do have thoughts about them. And what I would do is I would, I, I actually would take that as, I mean, there's kind of a, I felt like maybe from reviewers that looking at say this list that was meant to be a complete list, and I take that as, an, as kind of inspiration that no, this isn't, this isn't complete at all. There's lots of properties of these things like uh, that you might want to account for. The cost of plans for one especially is important here. And in fact, the relationship between your plans and goals, I didn't mention anything about goals here, but in the previous talk, you talked about, well, you've, you, your goals might change and you might have to you know, do different sorts of behaviors and stuff not, not talked about in here at all. But, investigating those would be, you know, and in, in being able to understand kind of what are all these intention related phenomena that we, we might want to implement in cognitive systems or talk about in the sense of cognitive systems is, is important. Oh, Pat. Hey, Will. So, you know, Paul Bellow has been telling me for years. Who? Paul is saying, saying intention is much more complicated than you think it is. And I go, what are you talking about, Paul? And he never explained it to me. And you did. So thank you. Well, so I'm convinced by by your position. So, like two years ago, I told Paul to make a list of how intentions were really complicated, and I used that list, and then I put my name on here as like the only author oh. because I wrote the paper. <laughs> it's, it's great. It's very constructive. <laughs> There's there. Okay, but did you intend to? So, so, but there's one one aspect of this that I'm that you 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 skipped over. It's an issue that. So people can only do complex activities like driving by building on lower level activities after they have automatized them. When you first learn to do those, you're conscious of them and it's effortful and then they become automatized and then you do the higher level stuff. After something's automatized, what's the status as an intent, you know, the activity as an intention? Is, is it, do we lose, because we lose intermediate, because it comes, because it becomes, we do it without thinking, is it, Intentional or not? Well, if you think of it this way, um, so when, when you're learning to drive and you're, you're kind of intending to drive and you have to, you, you have to think about maybe, I don't know, I learned on a manual. So you have to think about shifting the, the car, shifting gears in the car and everything. Um, yeah, that, I mean, that has a different character than later on, but you still have to, in, in the sense that, 
the, in, in the sense that your intentions influence your attention, what I would say gets better is that you don't have to, you don't have to do a lot of monitoring, you don't have to pay as much attention, you know, learn when you get better what you're doing is you're learning when to pay attention at the right so times. Even if we've lost access to the intermediate goals, it's still intentional, even though we're not aware of it anymore because we just do it, it's still intentional? Sure. Okay. I mean, it certainly can. And this, that, of course, goes back to something like uh, our in intention, action, action uh, under some description. So if I say I'm driving and you say, and, you know, I'm going to drive to your place and you ask me, well, did you intentionally shift gears? I'm going to, yeah, of course I did. You know, <laughs> I, of course I intentionally, well, why wouldn't I, right? Now, if I if I shifted, you know, if I was shifting in an unfamiliar car and I accidentally shifted in reverse and blew out the transmission, and you say, "Did you intentionally blow out the transmission?" I'd be like, "Oh no, 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 no." <laughs> so, so there are differences in you know the, the, there, but yeah, you you just you don't have to be aware necessarily of all the details of what's going on to know, and, and you don't have to behave like a beginner all the time to be uh, to, to be doing something intentionally. Uh, may I? Uh, could you please show the slide with the nine commandments? It's, it's nine plus or minus two. Well, that's exactly like. the question. <laughs> yeah, as we all know, the Mel Brooks skit in the history of the world, part one. But uh, uh, I have a few questions about uh, the choice of these nines and uh, uh, just a cursory look at this shows that some of these commandments apply not only for intention, right? And then how did you select these nines? The, sorry, these nine and not some others. What so, was the preference? So I said, Paul Bellow, make me a list of what intentions are and, and organize it, and he did. And so I went through that list and I, I pulled out kind of a smaller subset of those that we had implemented in different models. And I said, well, these I know about for sure. <laughs> and so, <laughs> so, but no, I mean, the, the point of the, the kind of, the answer sounds flippant, but the point is that this isn't, again, not meant to be conclusive. It's just, these are the ones that we, I have most experience with, I know citations for and so forth. So it was easier to present these as a starting point, but, but it, it, you know, I think it's easy to find like in your own work, anybody could come up with extensions to these if they're thinking, okay, well, what, what do I, what does my system need? I think I'm next. Um, hiding over here, Will. <laughs> your first question, you know, did AlphaGo intend to win? Oh, you wanted to give an answer? No, I, I, I no, there's I, I something said want missing. To win. I there's said want to there, win. There, there's something missing, it seems like, in that. And, and, and I kept expecting you to bring it in, and you, you never did, which is AlphaGo doesn't have another choice. There's only one thing it's doing, right? It's built to do exactly one thing. And so it seems really intuitively odd for us, it seems to me, to try and attribute lots of things to it because it doesn't it, it only has one function now if you want to step below that level and talk about the individual moves maybe that's an interesting interesting step to go to but if you tell pat that i don't have to be able i don't have to in, I have to have access to the cognitive artifacts below that level and i still intend things do, do you really want to claim you you want to say that even though it has no choice in in the task it's engaged in that we would want to say something about the intentional stance of AlphaGo? Well, or is that like just said, a red herring? I mean, it could be a straw man. That's like, a, like I said, it, I mean, it, there are people who will say that AlphaGo, you know, you can read articles of people saying, well, it wants to win, or it's really playing the game, and it's doing, you know, this, that, or the other. And I think you, to be, to be um, considerate, I, you know, there's a, Kind of a third th these three things if, if this is what you have in mind which a lot of people might have in mind from an ai standpoint when they're talking when you say something like um does it act like it wants to win and you and you point to these three things you say, of course but what what more is there that it needs to do it's just an ai system right and and sort of also i mean i have this asterisk down here 
AlphaGo has no choice but to play Go, but I mean, I, I don't know. There's all these other versions that have learned how to do different things, and and you know, I sure they're none gonna... of them. None of them actually choose to play a different game than the game that they're <laughs> they're told to play, right? Yeah. They don't try and play Alpha. They don't no. try and play Go when they're trying to play Space Invaders. I don't feel like it would be that hard to make them do that to satisfy your your <laughs> concern. <laughs> Ken Forbes asks online, experimenting with intentions at multiple time scales adds some methodological challenges. How might we tackle those? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Um, for Certainly it was a real challenge with driving. Um, and there are a lot of other challenges that whenever you start working in a particular problem, you're, you're going to find and you're going to uh, have to hack it out, Ken. But... Um, <laughs> It's, I, I agree, let me see if I, like even in this particular diagram, you know, the, the time scale for deliberation versus the time scale of motor control and when you recognize errors and how much, how much of a, a, a leeway you have temporally before you respond to them is gonna be a lot different. And, and that's again, implementation level details that you, you would want to have to kind of Hack out. I'm mostly concerned, I think, with whenever you, you know, this idea that if I'm going to build a system and I, I want to tell you that, well, and I say, well, it intends things or it believes things, I want to make sure that I, it's, I'm, you know, I'm clear about what I mean by that and how it's implemented. And if you say, well, it also needs to, for instance, take into account the time scale differences and needs to be able to report on those or needs to be able to weigh those different differently, then I should go back and, and fix my system. And we have a, we have a language then that we can talk, talk about these things. And, and you can, you can give me your quote, or I guess, quoting myself, you can give me this stakeholder feedback that, um, that, that is most, most important for actually building systems that we're going to get deployed in the world. So I'm wondering um, how you would deal with intentions that may not have well-defined actions. They're not necessarily ambiguous, but something like if you're driving near a school, then you want to drive cautiously. Yeah, so we were going to look into that with driving at one point, <laughs> and we were about like what cautiously might, might amount to. Um, and I don't have a good solution for that other than uh, you had to have to, if you were building a cognitive system or you're building a cognitive model that was going to be driving in the, in the environment and you wanted to say like, well, imagine you're in a taxi, just, you know, that's, and somebody, you, you have different types of passengers. One person is very nervous and says things like, um, oh, I need you to drive slower, or drive more cautiously or something like that then you would want to have to you'd have to build in a system some mechanism that affects probably the low level control really more more so than say the higher level intentions cautiously is something that's affecting kind of uh, if i were to go to this diagram one more time it's affecting at this level the level here m where you have parameter specifications motor guidance and control so somebody says in the situational anchoring part you know in the situation of driving you to the hotel says drive more cautiously, that affects how you set those parameters. And you want to have, be able to set up so that you can set parameters in particular ways. Yes, uh, I, I'm struck by uh, how similar this seems to uh, uh, specifications, particularly software specifications handled by system engineers who uh, break this all down in a similar way. They have derived intentions. They have actions that you're, they're trying to produce. Um, and it, it's almost one could map one onto the other if you uh, cared to. Yeah, I, I agree, and I, I think we should be more. I, I'm saying I think it would be wise if, when thinking about in mental states and the types of mental states that you might want to say your system has, to take a software engineering approach to it more so than than just kind of grabbing, you know, being a little more what we normally do, grab stuff off the shelf and just kind of hope it works. So. OK, 
Okay.